Well, hello everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be here um, by three, uh, to be joined by three exceptional people uh, to have a conversation about a panel that is called Access to Capital, Becoming Fully Invested in Driving More Equitable Outcomes. Um, so before we begin, um, I just wanna let you know who's in the virtual room with us, and then I'm just gonna ask them an opening question and they can tell um, this very impressive group of um, people and audience members about where they're sitting uh, to do with this uh, this conversation discussion. Um, so I have uh, Fran Siegel, uh, the head of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, uh, Alex Floxbart, uh, Opportunity Alabama, and Michelle Dunstan, Alliance Bernstein. My name is Allison Omens. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at Just Capital. So um, I love to get straight into the question. So Fran, I'm going to start with you. And in addition to this question, that it will be for all panelists would love to hear some reflections and background on your organization and how it fits into this dialogue. Um, so the question I have is when you hear 2050, the name of the conversation um, and conference uh, of this year, what is your and your organization's role in creating a more equitable future. Uh, so we'd love to hear how your work fits into that broad goal. So Fran, you'll go first, Alex next, and then Michelle will wrap us up. Fran? Thank you, Allison, and thank you to the American Geographical Society for hosting today's conversation. I'm Fran Siegel, and I serve as president of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, which is an organization with a vision to place measurable social, economic, and environmental impact at the heart of every investment decision. We work with a range of stakeholders, including investors, policymakers, um, corporate leaders, and other thought leaders to help build the field of impact investing. Just wanted to clarify what I mean when I say impact investing, and that is the practice of deploying capital for positive and measurable social, economic, and environmental impact alongside risk and financial returns across asset classes and geographies. So, so that could be investments from affordable housing in Detroit to financing distributed solar startups in Kenya to retail investments that account for environmental, social, and governance or ESG factors. So each was, is within the universe of impact investing as we define it. But regardless of how we define it, the truth is that every investment has an impact. And the impact could be positive, like quality jobs creation, racial and gender equity in senior corporate management. But they could be negative too, like poor paid sick leave policies and greenhouse gas emissions. And currently those impacts, whether they be positive or negative, are largely opaque to investors and to other stakeholders, like employees, suppliers, and communities. So the impact investing movement in part is an attempt to close that gap in transparency and accountability. Um, in our financial system. You know, you asked about 2050. Uh, we in the impact investing space and in the development space think a lot about the United Nations Development Goals, uh, which are, uh, we're supposed to be addressing them uh, by 2030, which is very soon. Um, and recently the gap between existing resources and achieving the UN SDGs was estimated to be as large as $7 trillion annually. There's no way we could get there through uh, government aid and grant capital alone. So it's really about aligning our investment assets commensurate with the SDGs. So as we look to 2050, and we're even seeing it now, investors are continuing to demand solutions to these intractable, large global challenges like income inequality, uh, systemic racism and climate change. They're also demanding greater transparency and accountability in the capital markets from corporations and institutional investors. And so we are very excited about um, working uh, to help effectuate the transition from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism, but doing so in a way that where we keep our eye on equitable economic growth. And we'd love to dig in on that a little bit later. Thank you, Fran. There is a lot to dig into there. Um, first, uh, Alex, over to you. Thanks so much. And uh, like, like Fran, I, I, I really appreciate AGS putting this on and asking these questions. I think it's, it's incredibly interesting that uh, the American Geographical Society is, is asking questions about what impact looks like in place over the next, you know, three decades. Uh, and it's, it's a really fun conversation to have. It's one that I don't get to have every day. So this is exciting. Um, 
So I'm Alex Blockspot. I'm founder and CEO of Opportunity Alabama. We are a 501c3 organization that was created uh, really after the advent of the Opportunity Zones program here uh, about three years ago to serve as an intermediary on behalf of the state, connecting communities, projects, and investors, really those three stakeholder groups with each other to get uh, quality community-facing projects uh, across the finish line, uh, done and across the finish line. Um, so we describe ourselves kind of as an e equitable economic development engine for Alabama's low-income places. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and it's, it's been interesting getting into this world over the last uh, three years and kind of building this ecosystem that we've built. Uh, we've done about 350 million worth of projects, um, that some of them in urban places, some of them in rural places, some of them in highly distressed places that I would have never thought investment possible before. Uh, some of them in places that were already on the upswing. Uh, and in those places, it's been interesting to think through how, to Fran's point, you know, investment uh, can can be made to be more impactful, can 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 challenge societal norms in in in, in a in a just and positive way. So it's been fair and incredibly interesting to build up this ecosystem. Um, and it's funny because opportunity zones is it, it is everyone thinks about it as this epically long hold uh, real estate investment program because you've got to be in for a decade. And the question on the table is what happens three decades from now, right? Um, which to me, when 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 we think about what real placemaking looks like, because at the end of the day, that's that's what we do at Opportunity Alabama, and that's when I think about the answer to this question, that's what I think about. It's how do you facilitate generational change in place, and how do you use tax advantaged vehicles to do it? Um, and it's been interesting to watch over the last two three years. And one of the things I'd love to to dig into as we kind of get into uh, into the questions is kind of how federal tax policy, how federal investment policy spread across multiple programs, new markets, tax credits, opportunity zones, but even program related investments that, that Fran deals with consistently, mission related investments that foundations uh, are, are making, how we can better harness low income housing tax credits. I could keep going and I will later, but um, how we can facilitate using federal policy to drive impactful placemaking um, because if we're creating more in programs that align long hold patient investors with uh, incentives to, to, to put capital locally and to do the kind of placemaking that we've seen plenty of evidence of here in Alabama, then I think we could be in a better spot you know, by 2050. Thank you, Alex. Um, Michelle, you're sitting in a very different seat. So I look forward uh, to having the conversation and first over to you to sort of explain where you're sitting. Thanks, Allison. I'm excited to be here today. And it's really great that the AGS is addressing this really important topic. And as Allison said, I'm sitting in a little bit of a different seat. I'm the chief responsibility officer of an organization called Alliance Bornstein. We're an asset manager, but we're a broad global asset manager, and we're relatively large. We have about 750 billion US dollars of assets under management across the world, across mutual funds, across retail investing, institutional investing, pension funds, high net worth individuals, with over 300 investment professionals. So we're very broad. And a lot of what you're going to be talking about today is impact investing, and we need that. What Fran and Alex are talking about is going to make a difference. But what can broad asset managers do? Broad asset managers manage more money around the world than impact investors do. And we think we also have a place in a just transition and in an equitable transition too. So let me talk a little bit about how we think that any asset manager can actually have an impact on the world. So at Alliance Bernstein, um, we take ESG very seriously and embed it across what we do for all our stakeholders. And we really do take a three-pronged approach to it. The first is our own corporate responsibility. If we are out there asking companies or issuers to do things better or do things different, our own practices need to mirror what we're asking others to do. So we're continually trying to improve and move towards best practices in our own environmental, social, and governance outcomes. The second is ESG integration. That's the incorporation of environmental, social, and governance factors in our investment management process. And we view that as fundamental to what we do. It makes us better investors, and we embed ESG in our process for all our equities, corporate credit, 
and um, multi-asset products. And then for investors or for our clients who want to go above and beyond ESG integration, we have a suite or platform of what we call portfolios with purpose. These have specific ESG goals or objectives over and above ESG integration. And this is much more similar to what Fran and Alex were talking about. These are our sustainable products aligned with the UN SDGs, our municipal impact product. That's one of the fastest growing parts of our platform. But today, I think we want to focus on that middle part, that integration part, which represents a lot of the assets around the world. And why do we view it as fundamental? Why do non-impact investors care? And the answer is they should, because ESG factors are material. These are fundamental risks and opportunities that any company faces. We can not only drive better societal outcomes by paying attention to them, but by identifying a wider array of risks and a broader set of opportunities, we can actually enhance financial returns for our clients. So think of it this way. What about a company with a lot of carbon? If that company is paying attention to it today, they are future-proofing themselves. They're better prepared to face the future with more sustainable cash flows and better opportunities and less risk. They're better prepared to face regulatory change, whether that's going to be carbon taxes or rules that are going to cause them to have to upgrade their systems or install scrubbers. They're better prepared to face changing consumer preferences for more sustainable products. And they're better prepared to attract and retain a workforce Younger people in particular, are, in particular are increasingly making value-based decisions on where they want to work. Companies that are doing this today are better prepared to face that future. They're better companies with better cash flows and better valuations. And we want to invest in those type of companies. And the way we think about doing it, we think you need to integrate ESG at each stage of your investment management process. So that's in your idea generation. What are the key risks that you're going to research, including environmental, social governance, and climate change factors? When you're doing your research and your financial forecasting, you should be thinking about it. We have proprietary frameworks for things like modern slavery, how to assess a company's own operations and supply chain for forced uh, labor and human trafficking. We have partnerships with organizations like the Columbia Climate School and how to integrate climate change into what we do. You need to integrate it into your investment decision-making process, and then you need to integrate it afterwards into stewardship, into engagement. When we meet with companies, we engage for insight, but also for action. And in proxy voting, we also integrate ESG into our, the impact that we as an asset owner can have on decisions. So happy to talk more about any of those things, but you know, um, in terms of making impact, you need impact players, but you need the broader financial markets to also take the, you know, take the role as uh, stewards of change very seriously. Thank you, Michelle, and um, thank you, everyone. I'm um, always so honored to be part in such a virtual room with um, so many interesting people doing um, such impactful work. So um, I, I want to start super broad because I know that a number of folks who are listening into this conversation are um, perhaps new to the com to the thinking about investors both driving impact, but also just thinking about capital and the impact that it may have through the markets on, um, you know, an equitable future on communities, et cetera. So, you know, Michelle, you were just talking about the role of investors and the role of ESG. I want to ask everyone, what is the role of investors in addressing a more equitable future? And more specifically, how are you individually seeing that role play out through the impact that you're trying to drive? Um, and, and to a degree, tell me the why. You know, if we have folks who are impact investors, but you also might have academics or nonprofits who are trying to engage with investors, just from where you're sitting, what's the role? How are you seeing it play out? And, 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 and for those who we know the why, what is the reason for doing it? Sure, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, great question, Allison. And, you know, let me try and address it from where we're sitting. You know, I think the why is twofold. One is, like I said, this makes us better investors. These factors are fundamental. Including them enhances the risk return for our clients. But we also view our role as making a difference, driving to the better future and having an impact on all our stakeholders and society. So that's what we try and do in our process and through particularly our research and our engagement. So from an asset manager point of view, 
we can have a role in capital allocation. Investment managers, broad investment managers, control trillions of dollars globally. If we are allocating that capital more responsibly, allocating it towards companies that are taking, whether it's climate change or other ESG factors um, into consideration in a very thoughtful manner, that is good for driving progress. If we are trying to engage and drive improvement in those companies, that is also creating change in society. So capital allocation towards entities, issuers, companies that are trying to do good, do better, deliver new products and services, or deliver the current products and services, but in a more responsible way, that is actually lowering their cost of capital, enabling them to know what, to do what they do in a better way at a cheaper cost and furnishing them with a runway for the future. I think the other role we have to play is as stewards of those capitals. So as asset owners, we have a responsibility to actually protect the interests of our clients and other stakeholders in these companies. And you know, one of the really big ways we can have an impact is through engagement. And let me define what I mean by engagement. So engagement is talking to companies, and we engage for two reasons. We engage for insight, to understand what a company is doing and to leverage that in our research and in our investment decision-making process. That's been done for years by every asset manager. They wanna do that. But it's really the engaging for action where you're gonna drive that change. And that is encouraging companies to take decisions that are in the best interests of their long-term sustainable cash flows. And we can do that. We meet with over 12,500 different companies a year. We engage frequently on ESG topics. Last year, for instance, in 2020, we documented over 2,400 ESG topic discussions with individual companies. Year to date, we're actually up about 40% from that. And that varies by topic. You've got carbon issues, waste issues, packaging issues, labor management, modern slavery, data privacy and security, diversity and inclusion, um, board governance. All of those are broadly encompassed in ESG. And when we engage, we often engage with an ask. We own these companies. We want them to succeed. And to succeed, that means paying attention to these ESG issues and getting better at it. So when we engage, we engage with our decision makers, the portfolio managers and analysts that make those decisions. They're talking one-on-one -on -one with the CEOs or the board of directors, and they're gaining traction. And the way we do it is we try and tie it back to why it makes them a better company. It's not just because it's the right thing to do or it's nice to have diversity and inclusion. We can show and demonstrate that companies that are more diverse actually outperform. Or in climate change, we can show why, at, um, why uh, addressing climate change today is going to better prepare to face you towards the future. It's gonna impact your cash flows, it's gonna impact your valuation. It's those financial metrics that typically resonate with the CEOs and the C-suite at companies. And that's how we can think about driving change but then we have to document it and we have to be public about it. Last year, we embarked on an ESG engagement campaign. We targeted over 350 of our largest equity holdings that did not have either climate change metrics or ESG metrics and executive compensation. And we engaged with the ask that they implement those. We actually produced a report on that. We called out the handful of companies that wouldn't talk to us, case studies on the ones that actually made a difference. Things were actually implemented based on those conversations. This year, we're following up we're actually adding our fixed income holdings to it. So it's not just equities, but also the corporate bonds that we hold. And in addition to um, ESG metrics and executive comp and climate change, we're adding modern slavery, forced and unethical labor to our topic of conversations. And again, we're gonna report on this. It's this whole ecosystem working together that's actually gonna drive the change that we need. Thank you, Michelle. Fran, I saw you nodding along and, and definitely want to bring you into the conversation about the role of investors and, and even really how ESG sort of fits into community and, and more localized work. But but just why don't you start and I'm sure there'll be follow up thoughts too. Yeah, I think in a way my perspective bridges Michelle's and Alex. So uh, Alex, I'll hand the baton to you in a second. Um, but I, I do reflect on the last 20 months um, and the extraordinary crisis set that we have been amidst uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, the economic crisis, the rise in awareness of systemic racism um, and climate change, direct experience of climate change and rising awareness. And that has really revealed um, the interconnectedness of sectors, the interconnectedness of people, um, communities, nations, regions. Um, it has exposed a range of systemic risks 
that universal asset owners need to take into account, but, but may, maybe haven't or, or haven't thought about them in quite that way. And it also re re um, revealed something called dynamic risk, where capital allocators and, and fiduciaries, asset owners, like the ones Michelle works with, um, uh, are bound by fiduciary duty. And so, uh, and, and for a long time, um, we've been um, precluded or discouraged from taking financially material ESG, environmental, social, and governance factors into account. Uh, the Department of Labor just issued a proposed rule where Allison used to work, um, uh, making it permissible and even saying that uh, foundation fiduciaries should take impact factors, financially material impact factors into account. But I think what this is showing, that the crises are showing, is that um, this idea of dynamic risks and systemic risk are really underexplored. And the interconnectedness of our people and our health and our supply chain and our environment are, um, they're inextricably bound. And that this, um, quality of our society and our financial capital markets and, um, and our economy are really important. And I'm hoping that we can't unsee what we have seen about interconnectedness. That has led the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance to think about a refreshed theory of change. And um, I'd love to just talk about it for a second, because again, I think it bridges Michelle and, and Alex's perspectives. Uh, one is that we need a broad financial systems level change to bring about uh, the reality of stakeholder capitalism, that voluntary commitments and voluntary reporting are insufficient to deliver that change. We need, you know, the era of self-regulation has been really important in creating a bit more transparency, but that we need mandatory ESG disclosure from the SEC, from the IFRS Foundation, which has over 150 um, uh, places of jurisdiction so that we have uh, available transparent and comparable data. Um, and of course, the, the disclosure is just, you know, the start, but um, we need to be able to understand, we as investors, we as um, community members, and we as citizens need to be able to understand the positive and the negative impacts, the corporations, investors that we all have. Um, so, but we believe that the transition to stakeholder capitalism is necessary, but insufficient to deliver just transition, to your point, Allison, insufficient to deliver inclusive economic growth, equitable economic growth. And in order to do that, we also need to build, do the kind of work that Alex is doing at Opportunity Alabama and other great practitioners around the country who are uh, vitalizing and revitalizing communities from the bottom up and really putting a, a, a focus on the voice of communities and the voice of workers in setting the priorities around community development at creating more access to capital for diverse entrepreneurs as paths to closing the racial wealth gap. And we have been doing a lot of work at the intersection of those two. And really, I, I would love to maybe later talk about what I think comes after stakeholder capitalism um, to just kind of get a little out there. And maybe that's a 20, should have been my 2050 answer. But um, I really believe that stakeholder capitalism is actually a way station to achieving a truly equitable and just uh, community. And that will require power sharing, power shifting, the reallocation of capital. And so that's sort of the long tail that we'll be looking to. So I'll, I'll take the baton and run with it from, from Fran's answer. Uh, I am proud that I am the most geographically focused answer of, of, of the three uh, in, from, from where I said, and Fran's exactly right. I, I do think that I'm the other side of the bridge that she just built. What's, to, to go all the way back, Allison, to the original question you asked, which is kind of where do we see investor interest and engagement and how do we harness that for more impactful outcomes? I sit in this very interesting chair of trying to facilitate connections between people that want to put capital locally and things that are happening locally that people that have capital don't necessarily know about. Um, so it's a very interesting chair to sit in because I think it's, it's, you, you've seen this across multiple different platforms, multiple different media. I mean, you've seen the explosion of crowdfunding, of, of you know, kind of local vesting of, of these kinds of movements. but. Um, the, ex the most recent accelerant anyway, has been 
you know, some of these federal programs, i.e. opportunity zones that give people that have real capital, I mean, capital that can really transform communities, um, the, the, the excuse to, to, to look a lot more seriously at the stuff that is happening in their backyard if there is an ecosystem for them to plug into, right? And I think that's the critical missing piece geographically, um, depending upon where you are and where you sit, is that there is every geography in, in my experience, and this, this is rural, this is urban, this is the heart of Alabama's poorest and in most rural geographies where you've got 15,000 people in an entire county, there is capital there. I mean, it's shocking, but there is still capital there. It's tied up in trees, it's tied up in land sometimes, right? But there's still capital there. Um, it just doesn't necessarily know the pathways to flow down to facilitate local growth and, and, and local development unless there is a corresponding pipeline of projects on the other side, right? So that's why this, I think that as we look towards, I, I love what Fran said and completely agree, obviously, that, that, that there is much more of a need for local intermediaries to be active in this space um, and to create. And I think as I look forward to, to 2050, going back to the first question, like the ability to create sustainable vehicles around those ecosystems to kind of encapsulate those ecosystems, um, whether it's a $5 million local ecosystem or a 500, you know, a small community or a $500 million ecosystem in a larger community or on a statewide basis, having vehicles that even could be launched out of platforms like Michelle's uh, and, and having connections to platforms like Michelle's is what's going to be the accelerant that gets us where we need to be in 2050 to, to, to really move the needle. Um, I love the bridging that's happening here. And so let me just stick with the bridge metaphor for a little longer um, because Alex, um, you know, I, I sure, I'm sure that most of our audience is a bit familiar with opportunity zones as a concept. I, I'd love to hear from you a little bit more explicitly about what it is, um, as well as for all of you, what other tools are out there now or that you think may emerge over the next couple of years. And let's use the term tool really broadly. It can be ESG as a concept, it can be partnerships, but, but if we're thinking about bridging to 2030, to Fran's point, and then 2050, I'd love to hear where we should be paying attention to and what we should be focusing on now that we think um, give us the ability to continue this path forward. And Alex, let me go back to you to just keep unpacking Opportunity Zones a little bit more as one recent tool. Sure thing. So Opportunity Zones are uh, a creature of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. They are one of, candidly, they're one of the simplest tools uh, that exist within federal kind of economic development placemaking policy to create local investment, frankly, national investment too. It's a program that was born out of a desire to buy people that have capital gain events, right? Out of this desire to see folks that have, uh, that control substantially appreciated assets to move, to, to liquidate those assets so that we can realize some of the kind of pent up gains that have been sitting on the sidelines for in some cases years, in some cases decades, in some cases generations, harness the capital from those from, from that kind of capital appreciation that's happened whether it's in the stock market whether it's in the real estate market um, and channel it into facilitating better outcomes for low-income places uh, and the the idea behind the program was let's pick basically each state gets to pick 25 percent of its designated low-income places uh, as opportunity zones alabama as an example about 60 percent of the state by land mass qualifies as a low income place and we're one of the poorest states in the country but you know most states 40 to 60 percent of the states are going to qualify as as low income by by, by census track um governors picked these back in 2018 um and as the program you know shaped up uh the incentive for the investors became pretty clear and that was if i can find let's say a million dollars to invest into one of these now designated opportunity zones I get two things on the front and one thing on the back. On the front, I get to defer paying capital gains taxes on the million dollars that I invested into uh, this opportunity zone for a, a, a few years until 2026. I then get a discount when I pay my tax bill of about 
in 2026. So both things nice, neither thing particularly earth shattering. The real reason that most people have gotten excited about this program is the backend benefit. And that is, again, think placemaking, right? Think transformational change over the course of a decade. So if that's the goal, then if I've, let's say, invested in three buildings with my million dollars and one business that's now operating out of those buildings and that business has done really well, it's hired a bunch of new employees, buildings look better, neighborhoods transforming around it, hopefully that million dollar investment I made is now worth three million or four million or five million. Uh, 10 years down the road. Uh, when I sell that investment 10 years down the road, I won't have to pay any capital gains tax at all on the appreciation of that investment, right? So, so that's, the, that's the really, that's the nice thing for most people. It is if I can bring patient capital to a distressed place uh, and, and then be patient with that patient capital. Uh, I, I can be handsomely rewarded in the form of avoiding tax on on the 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 the, the benefit that my capital is created for the neighborhood. Um, query whether it's actually working that way in practice across uh, every opportunity zone in the U.S. I can say in Alabama that I, I think you know we've seen that 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 theory borne out uh, by and large in both in rural places and in urban places. Happy to go into some examples later, but um, but that's the program. To your broader question about vehicles, though, I think what Opportunity Zones, at least for us, I'll speak from personal experience here, what Opportunity Zones did in Alabama was give me an excuse for having conversations with the folks that Michelle and Fran deal with every day on the capital side, right? With large institutional investors, folks like, you know, our state's largest insurance company, our state's largest banks, our state's largest utilities, uh, our state's largest family offices, right? That really hadn't ever thought about uh, in a substantive way what a kind of one pocket impact investing mindset could look like, right? That you can do well while doing good and you can use a vehicle, a sustainable vehicle for doing so. Uh, and so that's what we wound up doing. We wound up using this incentive as an excuse to actually set up, we, we now have our own opportunity fund that we have brought those folks into and have used to capitalize you know, we've got like 15 million worth of investment that we're using to capitalize projects right now, just out of that vehicle. And outside of that vehicle, like I said earlier, you know, we've, we've, we've capitalized um, another probably, you know, 300, 350 million plus worth of projects. So it's been fun to, it's been kind of fun to use this as an excuse to build a broader ecosystem. And in that broader ecosystem, the tools that we see getting used consistently, it's, it's the things I mentioned earlier, it's program related investments, it's mission related investments, uh, it's community reinvestment act dollars. Um, it's new markets tax credits to actually subsidize uh, project level uh, in investment. But all these programs working together, I think, you know, the, the, what uniquely what I think Opportunity Zones and what other programs that aren't quite as prescriptive, aren't quite as laser focused, don't have 1,800 pages of ratings that go along with them. Um, what I think they do is they give openings for conversation kind of that the, 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 the can wind up leading to uh, really interesting outcomes for, for communities, whether ultimately one of those people has a capital gain event or not, now they're aware of, of at least what's happening locally. Fran or Michelle, thoughts on, um, from after Alex's perspective on tools or sort of innovations that you're excited about now or in the future? Happy to hop in uh, to build on what Alex was sharing. Um, one thing that we have been looking at pretty closely is how uh, the confluence of crises that I talked about earlier, which of course disproportionately affects underserved um, and underestimated uh, communities like the ones Alex works in, are we're starting to see some new sources of capital going to communities. Uh, the Alliance was commissioned by the Federal, Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, to develop a report that maybe I can put in the chat called Impact in Place. And it provides a snapshot of the community investing landscape in response to the crises over the last year and a half or so. And um, we really wanted to understand where the field is heading in terms of emerging sources of capital for local main streets. And so um, more traditional players, and, and Alex touched on this a little bit, philanthropies and investors motivated by policies like Opportunity Zones, uh, Community Reinvestment Act, Low Income Housing Tax Credit, New um, Markets Tax Credits, 
Um, so we, we really wanted to look at new sources of non, you know, tax benefit uh, or regulation, regula regulation motivation. And so we saw some major corporations um, invest in communities, in minority depository institutions, in black and brown led um, uh, venture funds. We saw some money coming in and very responsive from donor advised funds. Um, and we also started seeing some participatory investment strategies, which I'd like to um, talk about in a moment. But what we're hoping is that these new entrants weren't just getting drawn in so that they could make, uh, especially the corporations, so that they could uh, make announcements, but that it actually shows that corporations and investors are seeing the value uh, that of communities and the partnership that community they have with communities. Um, I will also say that uh, an approach that we are very, uh, very strongly supportive of is, and, and just like core to our work, and that's the principle of authentic community engagement, being required as a path to community, delivering community outcomes. So we mean through the investment process from pre-planning pre to exit. The priorities of local leaders, small business owners, residents, and others should be thoughtfully considered and accounted for. And I will say that Alex's work and his team's work at Opportunity Alabama and their community engagement practices, we think are best in class and represent a high bar. Um, so if folks are interested in learning more, I'm sure that, that he has some great resources on his website. And then lastly, I will just touch on this uh, participatory investment models, which is really about power sharing and power shifting. And I talked earlier about like the long tail of 2050 moving from a paradigm of stakeholder capitalism, which we are far from achieving so far, to one of true equitable economic growth. And I believe, and we believe that shifting power and shifting decision-making to communities themselves, incorporating worker voice and, and other local voices, folks with the lived experience um, is, is really important uh, and compelling and necessary path forward for not only the future of community investing, but also creating this equ equitable economic growth that we've been talking about. I think probably the best known example of participatory investment is the Ujima Fund in Boston, which is a democratically managed fund for small business and infrastructure projects in Boston's communities of color. And community members are lifted up both in the governance structure and the capital stack, and that local residents who invest very small amounts of small investment minimums, I should say, are prioritized in terms of returns compared to the larger investors, philanthropic investors. There are other examples like the Buen Vivir Fund, uh, which has uh, employed participatory grant making practices for a long time. Actually, they're, they're, uh, affiliate, um, they're an affiliate of Thousand Currents. They've done a lot of participatory grant making practices. Buen Vivir Fund works in um, North America, Latin America, Southern Africa, and South Asia with the goal of really turning the traditional financial power, uh, financial and investment decision-making power dynamic on its head. Um, and we've seen this actually from asset owners. Heron, which is a private foundation here um, in New York, has been exploring setting up local investment committees and committee committees in a few communities <laughs> um, across the country, a lot of C's in that sentence. Um, where the communities will ultimately hold decision making rights in terms of where and how the funds flow. So, you know, as I transition to Michelle, um, I do feel like some of these approaches, by definition, by design, are hyper local and subscale. And I do wonder how some of the work that Alex is doing in communities in rural and urban tribal communities, black and brown communities, some of these participatory models. You know, it's it's something that I'm really fascinated with, uh, Michelle, is how these on the ground opportunities, the deep impact stuff that Alex is working on can interoperate with the large wealth platforms and banks that you represent. And, you know, that's actually a really good transition because one thing I was going to say was partnerships, collaboration, education are actually key here on that to bring what historically has been very specialized or very local knowledge and be able to disseminate that or have an impact across a wider array of corporations, countries, et cetera. So, you know, one of the things that we do is, I mentioned it before, we have a partnership with the Columbia Climate School at Columbia University here in New York. 
And we had a relationship with them, specifically with the um, Earth Institute, who's a basic science research organization within Columbia for the past few years. Several years ago, we kind of realized that climate change was going to be fundamental to what we do, that it was having an impact on companies' cash flows and valuations, and we needed to address it. But like any asset manager, we hire financial analysts. Our analysts stick around for a while. I was an analyst and portfolio manager in our equities group for 15 years. And when I hit 15 years, I was like, wow, I'm average now in terms of my tenure. 15 years ago, no one really thought about climate change when it came to investment management. So we have a base of analysts that are really good at understanding their companies and their sectors, but aren't climate change experts. And we needed to educate them. And what we needed to do, we're not going to make them climate change experts overnight. We don't need to. But we wanted everyone to have a basic understanding of climate change, what the risks and impacts on their companies were, to be able to ask those tough questions of um, various stakeholders, whether it was the companies themselves, but the other people we do research with, and then to know enough when to stick up their hand and say, I need more help with this. I think there's something really wrong here, but I don't know enough to be able to you know, dig into it myself. So the first thing we did was education. We co-developed a climate change curriculum that covered the basic science, legal, uh, public policy, and regulatory form frameworks, climate change solutions, and then how to translate that into financial analysis. And in 2020, we educated all our investors. Over about 300 of our um, analysts and portfolio managers took the training. Our executive team, including our CEO, and our board of directors, including the chair. It's not just us, we want the whole company to do this. And what that enabled us to do was be smarter about it, be able to engage with these companies to drive change, and be able to disseminate that on a much wider scale than having one single climate change expert. We also do have climate change experts on staff. And when our analysts or portfolio managers get stuck or stick up their hand, they help them dig in. But that's the first stage, was that internal education effort. We then um, threw it open. It's not just about educating us, but what about everyone else? So we threw it open to our clients in early 2021, and we were expecting maybe 200 to 250 of our clients to take the training. Over 1,000 of the world's largest asset owners actually enrolled in the program. That's how much asset owners, large pension funds and corporations around the world are actually paying attention to this these days. In the meantime, we've pivoted our relationship to more research. So this year, Columbia um, uh, built a new climate school. It's the first purpose-built multidisciplinary climate school of its kind in the entire world. The Earth Institute is moving into the climate school as are uh, parts or affiliations with the law school, the business school, the school of economics, public policy, et cetera. Climate change is too big for any one entity organization to solve, and we need to do it together. And this is a two-way relationship. We've provided training to the scientists on how the capital markets actually think about making investment decisions and allocation. It's not all about, hey, we need more lithium for electric vehicle batteries. Let, you know, lithium companies are great investments. It's like we actually have a surplus of lithium, so maybe this isn't a great investment right at the moment. They wanted to understand how their science can move markets. Um, we're helping them think about what these schools and what this program should look like. What does the scientist of the future look like? They need to understand biology or chemistry or whatever, but they should probably understand a little bit about the evolving regulatory framework and how capital markets make decisions. And what does the investor of the future look like? I would strongly advocate they need to understand a little bit more about communities, just transitions, and climate change. In the meantime, we are embarking on a couple of longer-term research projects with them, and we have already kicked off, I think we're up to five kind of bespoke workshops. So this is our own investors engaging one-on-one -on -one with their scientists on topics that we're already researching, but that we can do better together. So whether that's topics like how is hydrogen going to advance or renewables, um, or even things as discrete as how does sea level rise and sea temperature rise impact salmon fisheries in Norway, Scotland, Chile, and inland. We haven't known a lot of salmon fisheries. Those are things that we need to understand. And we publish on this. All the material that we do with Columbia is available on our website to anyone who wants to look at it. So it's about educating ourselves, impacting the capital markets through our allocations and our decisions, but also bringing that research and that intelligence to the broader community where we can, particularly our clients who actually control or own a lot of the money around the world that makes things go. 
Thank you, Michelle. Um, and this has been such a rich conversation. Um, I appreciate all of the um, elements of this that it'll take capital to get to this future state of 2050. I know we could go on for a lot longer, but um, just wanted to thank you all. Uh, thank the American Geographic Society for having us. Um, really appreciate it again and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue in many places.